you need as much help as you need to write these reports. How many of you have seen the how to write a lab report PowerPoint presentation? How many of you have that presented to you at the start of the semester? Put your hands in the air. How many of you saw a PowerPoint presentation on passive voice? Good. Those of you who are in sections that I teach, you don't have to put your hand in the air for a question like that. Yes. I know I did, so don't worry about it. So I'm going to be doing a lot of the digital equivalent of chalk and talk. Uh, but if you have questions at any time, just put your hand in the air and I'll call on you. I'm going to be showing you some examples of what I think your writing should look like. So feel free to take pictures of that if you want to do that for future lab reports. Additionally, my email address is dto223 at nyu.edu. If you want me to email you this PowerPoint presentation, I'll be happy to do that. Just send me an email and ask for it, and I'll send it to you. Everyone set on that? All right, so let's begin. So, lab reports from abstract to conclusion. So essentially what you're doing in these lab reports is you're telling a story. And again, I've got to apologize for students in this button here who, have, who are already in some of my sections. You've heard some of this before. But you're here, so this will be helpful for you in any case. So essentially, it's, you're telling a story. You went into the lab. You did this exercise. You came out of the lab with a body of data that supports a particular conclusion. Right? So in the case of the mousetrap car lab report, and this PowerPoint presentation uses the Mousetrap Carter Lab Report as an example throughout. Your data supports a conclusion about why your car placed first, placed last, placed second, placed third, whatever place that may be. And so what you should be doing in the lab, in the lab reports that you're turning in is telling a story, essentially, about what happened in the lab and making an argument that says, the reason this car won is X, Y, and Z. The reason it lost is Y, X, and Z. Right? So you're making an argument with a lab report from start to finish. And the single most important element of the lab report is your data. The data tells the story of the lab exercise. So your data should be featured throughout the lab report. Many of you, some of you might have already had this experience, and many of you, perhaps even all of you, as you move forward in your careers here in, in, in NYU or in a professional career outside of here, We'll have the experience where you're going to stand up, you're going to create a PowerPoint presentation. You're very proud of it. The first five slides are sort of an introduction to the exercise that you did, and how interesting it was. And you're going to start to present the thing, and a voice from the back of the room is going to say, get to the data. And all of those wonderful slides, the first five ones that you did, you're going to skip over those, and you're going to get right to the data. Because that's what engineers want to see. That's what scientists want to see is your data. Your nice story about your data that you tell before you present the data is of much less interest to them. So essentially, this is about science writing the storytelling. The book I am referring to here is by Keith Hortshoy, the college writing. And Hortshoy says essentially, this is what you're doing in science writing in college. You're asking in the introduction, what were you doing and why? In your methods, what we call procedure, you can do it. In your results, what we call data and observations, you're asking, what did you find out? Our conclusion and discussion, what did the essential that report? These are the major sections. All of you are familiar with these by this point in the semester. I hope anyone not familiar with the major sections will have report. Good, good. So the abstract is a summary of the report, so you write this last. You cannot summarize the report if you have not first written the report. I report first, then write the abstract. This should be written in the past tense. And as you can see here, what I require of my students in my section is that they put their major data in the abstract. It should be an objective, the major data, which are the competition results, and then a conclusion, which is essentially, how did you place in the competition? So this is what I ask my students to do. I will tell you right now that as far as abstracts and peer-reviewed journal articles go, this is atypical. You don't normally do this in abstracts in peer-reviewed journal articles. Does everyone here know what a peer-reviewed journal article is? 
Does anyone not know what that is? Okay, so when you continue in your college career, and certainly when you get out of here, you will have the opportunity to do a study, perhaps more than one study. You'll produce a body of data when you do that study. You'll decide, and your co-authors might decide along with you, that that data is important. It advances the field of civil engineering, or mechanical engineering, or electrical engineering, or medicine, or chemistry, biology, whatever it might be. So you will write an article that uses that data, and again, has a structure to it that's similar to what we do in this class. You will submit it to a peer review journal, which means essentially that that article will be reviewed by other chemists, by other electrical engineers, by other mechanical engineers, by other civil engineers, and they will say, yes, this is important. If it's accepted for publication, it will go through a whole series of revisions and edits, and then it will be published in that peer review journal. Peer review journals are how scientists and engineers advance knowledge in their field. It's also how they brag a little bit. There's an element of bragging in peer review journal articles. But ultimately, it's how we learn and how we teach each other, and again, how we advance knowledge in particular fields of industry. And many of you, I hope, will end up publishing in peer review journals. But again, typical. A peer review journal is generally more general, not containing necessarily specific uh, data. I require my students in my sections to put their data in the abstract because I want, a student, I want the students to emphasize the data throughout the report. So why do I want to see it here? This abstract assumes that the mousetrap car competition in this lab had three competitors. As you can see, the first paragraph is the objective. The second paragraph is how the mousetrap card that is the subject of this report performed on its three trials. And then the final paragraph is how the competitors performed on their best trials in which they traveled their longest distance. So you read this, you've now summed up the entire report. You know how this card performed compared to the other two. You know what the, what the competition results are. So that's what I look for in my abstracts. Now the introduction, we tell you in the manual, has to be at least three paragraphs long. If you have not written three paragraphs in your introduction, you've not written enough. Okay. So that's a general rule of thumb that you should bear in mind with your introduction. What you're doing in your introduction is you're giving the reader all of the information that the reader needs to understand or to know to understand your data. Right? So, again, in the mousetrap car lab, you had to talk about propulsion. Right? That lab exercise was, effect was essentially about propulsion. So you had to talk about it, you had to define it, and you had to discuss how it was applied in the lab exercise. If you considered rotational inertia or friction, if you considered a gear train or used a gear train in your design, you had to discuss these things, you had to define them, and you had to discuss how they were applied in the lab. Finally, it's a competition lab, so you had to discuss the rules. There was no ratio for the lab one, so you didn't have to discuss the ratio. But the final paragraph of your introduction should be your design strategy. How did you take these concepts, propulsion, rotational inertia, friction, a gear train, the rules, and apply them in your design with the intention of winning the competition? That's what we ask you to do in the introduction. Additionally, your introduction should be organized in a fashion such as this. It should go from the general to the specific. A general discussion of propulsion with some discussion of how it was applied in the lab. Same thing with rotational inertia, same thing with friction. And then finally coming down to the rules and a discussion of how, you know, what controlled the result in the mousetrap car lab. Right? So from the general to the specific, that's true of all lab reports that right in this class. This is an example of the start of an introduction for the mousetrap car lab. Again, organized from the general to the specific. This will be a mix of tenses, sometimes past tense, sometimes present, sometimes perhaps future tense. But as you can see, it starts by discussing propulsion and then specifically discusses how it is applied in the lab. Then there's this final sentence, which is an introductory sentence which says to the reader, I'm about to talk about these other concepts. Right? And so then the next paragraph would be about maximizing propulsion, then about minimizing friction, then about the rules, and if rotational inertia was considered, that would be the next paragraph. 
So the other thing to bear in mind, as you saw with the slide on the abstract and with this one, is that your writing must be organized in paragraphs. I assume your writing consultants have already discussed this with you in your classes. Am I right? Has anyone not heard about paragraphing from your writing consultant yet in your classes? Okay, good. So as you know, every paragraph is about one topic, one idea. The first sentence of the paragraph should relate the subject of that paragraph to the overarching topic of the report. And you can sort of do that when you have an introductory sentence like this last one here, which says, again, to the reader, I'm about to discuss these subjects. And then these would be organized in paragraphs, one topic per paragraph. So now your procedure section follows next. And the essence of this section is repeatability. I should be able to follow your procedure section and replicate your results. It has to be that good. It's got to be that specific. So if I can't build your mousetrap car or your hot air balloon by following your description, you have not written a, a sufficient procedure section. One thing to bear in mind here is that you can use pictures of your mousetrap car or your hot air balloon or whatever, whatever the device is that are located in your data and observations section. Obviously, they would be labeled figure one, colon, mousetrap car, period, figure one, colon, hot air balloon, period. And you can make reference to those pictures in this section to help the reader understand how you built this mousetrap car or how you built this hot air balloon. So use your illustrations with your text together to give the reader a better understanding of what you did. So this section is, written, is presumed to be written in chronological order, so you should not be using first, second, third, fourth, then, next, next, next. I can tell you that I feel this way and my fellow writing consultants feel this way. Reading first, second, third, fourth, next, 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 next then, then, then gets pretty annoying. So you shouldn't do it. Again, this section is presumed to be written in chronological order. You list your materials in the first sentence. The materials used in this lab were, then just list them. Right? And again, repeatability is the essence of this section. And I'm going to show you a couple of things here. <clears throat> this is an outline for the product and quality improvement lab. This would be what I expect to see in a procedure section for lab three. Right? As you can see, it's detailed. It gives all the steps necessary to perform the lab exercise. Everyone seeing this? Big enough in the back row, can you see it? <coughs> yes, no, sort of, don't care, fine. So, but it's gotta be this detailed, right? Your procedure section has to be this detailed. So it's complex, it's long in some of the lab reports, but this has gotta be this detailed in mind about lab three. You've written this. This is the testing for the original robot in lab three. Then you go through the process of taking the thing apart and rebuilding it. You would also describe that process in your procedure section. Then you're going to test the modified robot again in the lab three exercise. You need to do this again. Anyone? Is that a no? You shaking your head no? Why would you not need to do it again? You would say uh, the step for repeating. Correct. Correct. So in your writing, you should always be looking for opportunities to write less. Right? Since you've already described how the testing was done, all you have to say is the tests that were performed on the original robot were performed on the modified robot. You don't have to describe the testing process a second time. Right? So as you're writing all of these reports, bear, keep that in mind. It may not be necessary to always write uh, a set of sentences because you may have written that in the section previously. Now here, similarly, this is for lab four, introduction to lab view. So in my mind, and this is what I would be looking for from my students in my session. This would be the procedure section for lab four introduction to lab view. This is essentially software documentation that we're asking you to write. So it's very complex. 
And one of the things you'll see when you sit down to start writing lab for introduction to lab view, none of you have done lab view yet, correct? You've done lab four? Okay, so what you were told in the manual is that you only document the build of the heating and cooling VI. You're gonna build three virtual instruments in this exercise. And in the procedure section, you only document the build for one of them. That's because it's long. It's a very long section. It requires a great deal of writing. So this is what I would expect to see, right? Where you're talking about the menus that you use, the windows that you use, the objects that you, you know, dragged and dropped from one menu into the front panel or back panel. For those of you who haven't done the exercise yet, this will be apparent to you when you do the exercise. Again, it's long and it's complex, and, and it is essentially software documentation that we're asking you to perform. And that's what it should look like right here. But, so, but again, I'm showing you these two examples because I want you to understand that repeatability is the essence of the procedure section. What we're asking you to do, and again, I should be able to follow your description and your procedure section and replicate your results. It's got, everyone have a shot of this? So, yet another example of what the procedure section should look like. This would be for the mousetrap card lab. As you can see, first sentence is the materials used, and then a description of how the work was done. And within the text, as you can see, there's reference to the figure, right? So the reader can just go look at the figure and obtain a better understanding of how this thing was built. Right? This is like, as some of my students have said to me, it's like going to Ikea and buying a piece of furniture. You've got a set of instructions that's got text and pictures with it, right? So that's what you're doing. Question? Uh, is it better to put the images in line with the text, or should they be on just all the images on one page when you're referencing to figures? I, I don't think I understand your question. So if I was writing this procedure section for one and the same page, or would I put all the figures I reference in my report on their own separate page. I would put them in the data and observation section. All together? Yeah, place. that's. I mean, that's generally the safest bet. I mean, most of the, the TAs, and I can tell you that some of the writing consultants look for your data, all of your data to be in data and observations. So picture is data, a table is data, a graph is data. So that should be in data and observations. And it occasionally happens that they'll penalize you for having it in the wrong section. They shouldn't but that will happen. So the safest thing to do is to put all of your data in data and observations, and because you've got them labeled, you can make reference to them anywhere else in the report. The only place you should not have references to illustrations, tables, figures, that sort of thing is in your abstract. But you can make reference to the illustrations anywhere else in the report. Now, data and observation. This is, in my mind, the most important section, because as I told you before, the data is the most important element of the report. So again, what we're looking for here, and this would again be a mousetrap car lab, picture of the car, labeled like so, as you can see, figure one colon mousetrap car. You're gonna discuss the car's components, any modifications made to the car between trials. You'll discuss the competition results, making reference to your table that will contain the competition results. You'll discuss the car's results, and then again, the competition results. And then ideally, you would have pictures of the other cars and you would discuss those other cars uh, in this section, just what they look like. So again, you're not analyzing your data here, you're simply presenting. Right? So you shouldn't be explaining why you won or lost the competition in this, in this section. You should merely be presenting your data. So these would be examples of what I would expect the illustrations to look like, right? Picture of the car from two different views, label, telling you what the view is, a period at the end of the caption, and then you can make reference to these anywhere else in the report, except, as I said, in your abstract. Now here would be the table of the competition results for the mousetrap vehicle competition. Again, labeled table one, colon, mousetrap vehicle competition results, period. And then they're listed here. Something to bear in mind, and this is standard in all peer review journal articles. For tables, the label and the caption go above the illustration. For figures, figure one and the caption go below the illustration. Everybody got that? 
That's standard in peer review journals. Again, tables above, figures goes below. So now this is what I would expect to see in a data and observation section for a MOSFAP card lab report. Again, a discussion of the modifications made to the car between trials with reference to the illustrations, figure one, figure three, uh, and then a paragraph about how the car that is the subject of this report performed during its trials, with again, a parenthetical reference to the table that contains the competition results. And then the final paragraph would be how the other two cars performed uh, on their best trial, in which they traveled the greatest distance. And again, as you can see, there's reference to table one there that contains the competition results. So the, the point here of these reports is that the text and the figures work together to make a single comprehensive whole, right? The text and the, and the, and the illustrations work together, right? The report has got to be a single comprehensive whole from start to finish. Now, finally, this is where you make your analysis. This is going to be a mix of tenses. So in a mousetrap car lab report, why did you place in the place that you did? Why did you win first? Why did you place last? Why were you second? Why did the other cars win the places that they won? What changes would you make to the car to improve its standing in the competition? So that's what that's a sort of analysis that we're looking for here. So you've presented your data and data observations. Here's where you're going to analyze your data. Right? So this would be an example of what your analysis could be in a mousetrap car laboratory, as you can see. Right? Again, it's reiterating the data about the first place car and explaining why it placed first, or at least this author's speculation about why it placed first. Then there's discussion about the second place car, its result, and some discussion about why it placed second, and then the third place car, how it placed, and why it placed second. This is the analysis that you would do. Now, I said this to my students in some of my sections. A major problem with the mousetrap car lab report is that you don't actually have a whole lot of information to analyze. About the cars is how far they travel. Probably didn't have an opportunity to spend a lot of time looking at the other cars in the competition. So you really can't reach a great conclusion about why they performed the way that, the way that they did. You're in a much better position in the high air balloon lab report because you can use the ratio which uses time of flow, cost, and payload. Is that something we need to do? You can use time of flow, cost, and payload to make your analysis about why the first place balloon plays first, why the second place balloon plays second, by looking at the three components of the ratio. As you move forward in this class, you're going to participate in other competition labs. And I believe most of the lab reports in this class are, in fact, competition labs. I think I'm right about that. Maybe. And all of them, from this point forward, will use a ratio to determine the winner. So your analysis in those lab reports should look at the components of the ratio and argue that there are two components of the ratio control the results and produce the winner. Or not. There may be some other reason for it. But that's where you should begin your analysis, is looking at the ratio that determine who won, which design won, which design lost. So now this is a citation format. Anyone having problems with this in any of their lab reports? Has everyone seen the work cited document that we produced in this class? Anyone not seen it? Okay. So you can have more than one source in this section, um, but you must have the manual in this section. Um, and then we have finally the original data section and your lab notes belong in original data and only there. You cannot have your lab notes in any other section of the report. Now, here's some final notes about the lab reports that you're doing in this class. And this is true across the board for all lab reports. All of your illustrations have to be labeled. Figure one, figure two, figure three, table one, table two, table three, graph one, graph two, whatever the illustration is. And again, tables goes above, figures goes below, graphs goes below. And then you must have in-text references to all of your illustrations. Right? You've got to have that. There must be in-text references to the sources in your works cited section. So if you've got just the manual in there, you've got to have citations in your text to the work to the manual from the works cited section. All in this class, 
All of your measures, with the exception of, ratio, uh, of ratios, must have units. Everybody understand what I'm saying there? Like you can't have a measure of heat without Fahrenheit, Celsius, Kelvin, whatever it is. It got to have units. You cannot have a measure of length without inches or centimeters or meters, whatever the particular measure is. You've got to have that. Ratios, and I'm sure all of you know, do not have units. Start. Report is an argument, right? It is not maybe this, maybe that, but have been this, but that other thing. You you start writing your report. You've got this data. You believe the data supports a particular conclusion. Conclusion. Your hot air balloon won the lab because and you are arguing for that conclusion from the start to finish of the report. As I talked about peer review, peer review journal articles before, peer review journal articles are arguments. The authors believe that their data supports a particular conclusion, and from start to finish, they are arguing for that conclusion. You must also argue for a particular conclusion in your lab reports from start to finish. Now, you should also complete a draft of your report about 48 to 72 hours before it's due, set it aside, uh, and then go back and review it after 24 hours. I'm seeing some smiles in the group of people not doing that. Is that uh... All right. You've got to get in the habit of doing that. You've got to give yourself enough time to be able to review your report and you know, set it aside and go back to it and make a review of it. You can share your report with another student who is not taking this class in any section and ask that student to comment on it, but make absolutely certain that student is not taking this class. You can share it with a friend or a family member who's not attending school here and ask them to review it. But again, do not show it to somebody who's taking this class that might end up getting you in trouble. You might be accused of plagiarism. And for every report that you write, you must read the assignment section in the lab manual and answer the questions in the correct sections that are contained in the assignment section. And now finally, these are resources that are available to assist you. Your writing consultant can meet with you outside of class. You can go to the uh, Writing Center at JAB 373. Those people are very good. The students who work there have all taken this class before and can certainly assist you in writing this class. And then on the lab manual, you can read specifications for writing your lab reports. And there are also some annotated lab reports there that will be of some assistance to you. Questions? Nothing? You're all perfect. Question. If you intend on referring to them in your text, you should label them. As, as I'm sure all of you know, you're not required to have your lab notes in your lab report. But if you're, again, if you're going to refer to them in your text, you should label them because that's the only way to identify the document. Yes. Slide over there, please. I'm sorry, that's the question again. Yes. 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 Something to bear in mind about lab notes, folks. I have. Can you repeat the question? The question she was asking are your lab are your lab notes the model drawings that you make in the lab? That you and the answer is yes. So something to bear in mind about your lab notes. You cannot put your lab notes in the main body of your report because they just you know they don't cut. They're just sloppy. They're handwritten sloppy notes. Frequently they're hard to read. And they just don't belong in the main body of the report. And far more often than not, the information that's contained in your lab notes is found in other illustrations in a much more usable, much more readable form. For example, I have had students who take some like idiot sketch of a mousetrap car lab, a uh, mousetrap car that looks something like so. Right? And they'll put that in their lab report in the data and observation section and ask me to look at it. There's no way I could build a mousetrap car from that sketch. There are no dimensions on it. I, you know, I have no idea how it's built. It just doesn't contain any usable information. And it's frequently the case that the same lab report, the same data and observation section that has that horrible sketch in it, will have two or three pictures of the car. 
The pictures of the car contain useful information. This thing is worthless. So it shouldn't be in your data and observation section. Now, if you're brilliant, if you've got, you've got a great drawing hand, if you're a great artist, you can render a great sketch and it's got dimensions on it. You know, if I could build your car and looking at your sketch, by all means, put it in your data and observation section. Or, instead of spending an hour making that sketch, take three pictures of your car and put those in your data and observation section. So if you've got the time, by all means, create a brilliant sketch of a mousetrap car or a hot air balloon. I suggest your time is better spent taking pictures and putting those in your data and observation section. Any other questions? <laughs> In the procedure part, can I put, put, put some pictures of, say, the master vehicle when it is not made, when it is uh, in the procedure of making, say, just some brakes with the frame, and then another picture attached with wheels, another picture put on the mouse, another picture with the, uh, with the, the glue on. Yes, yeah, so the, the question is, Correct me if I'm wrong here. The question is, can you take pictures as, say, a mousetrap car is being built and put those pictures in your procedure section? The answer is yes, you can absolutely do that. Again, for the example of, of a piece of furniture that you buy at IKEA, the text and the drawings that you get in the instructions do exactly that. They show you the parts that you're going to use, and they show you the illustrations as you're building the thing and putting it together. So you can, you can absolutely do that. Any other questions? Okay, you done? That's up to you. I think we're done. It's nearly a piece of practical advice that says. Uh, yeah, you're, you're if, my writing consultant. Right. So yeah, it says if you if you put it in the wrong if you put it in a, in a spot where it's not normally expected to be, mm -hmm. you might end up incurring a penalty. I don't care, from my perspective, if it's in procedure, it's fine. If it's in data and observations, it's fine. But, but I shouldn't do both. Then. No, you don't need to do both. Okay. It's the same material, correct? Okay, yeah. Yeah, no, you don't need to do both. And, anyway. and then for introduction, they, um, I, always, I just put one in-text citation at the like, very last paragraph, but should I do in-text citation for each paragraph? Every, everywhere that you are relying on a particular source, you have to have an in-text citation here. Oh, so I just can't refer in, like, uh, one in-text citation for the entire... No, it's got to... So, everywhere that you're relying, that uh -huh. a paragraph relies on a particular source, you can put it at the end of the paragraph. Uh -huh. You can have an in-text citation within the paragraph and at the end as well. Mm -hmm. And how do you want us to put the equations? I just integrated between, and I just put an enter and then put equation and then start a new paragraph. Are you talking about lab three? Uh, in general, but like for lab three, I use um, equations the in the way. Yeah. Calculations. No. Like, Equation for the like, percent accuracy. Percent yeah, you just put it in the text and then you label that as an label it as an equation. Oh, I need to label. Yeah, the because you're going to make reference to it in the text. Uh -huh. yeah? uh, so so that would go below. I would prefer that you not do that because you might want to make reference to it elsewhere in the text. So, for example, uh, okay. you you've got it in your introduction. Let's say it's the equation for percent accuracy. Then you get down to your procedure section and you'll say. Using the equation seen in equation one, percent accuracy oh, was calculated. Okay. Da 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 da. Oh, now that makes sense. Okay. Right. So yeah. you can, if you don't label it, you can't use it anywhere else. Oh, uh, okay. I I think I get it. All right. Oh, okay. Thank um, you. So, yeah. so, so we label the we label the equation uh, for equation one or the bigger one. I would well, I would do equation one. Oh, okay. Thank you. But you do want to label it because again. You, you're not just going to use it in your introduction section. You're going to use it in presumably procedure, maybe even data and observation. So if you don't label it, you can't make reference to it. Um, so for last three, we were given like a step-by-step -step procedure on how to build the robot. Do we have to like make reference to that in the procedure? No. You can say the robot was built according to the instructions for the green robot, the yellow robot, the red robot. Right? I, I, I explained like step-by-step. How you built the original robot? Yeah. That's impressive. Well, good for you, but you didn't have to do that. Uh, 
it, there won't be a pen, there's not a penalty for that, but again, it's it's what I talked about with the the procedure section for the testing. You always want to look for a place to be to write less, to be more efficient in your writing. So if you can simply say, go look at the instructions on the manual for the red robot, that's all you have to do. Thank you. You're welcome. That was it. Thank you. Yes. Question? Question? Yes. DTO. Two two three at NYU dot edu. You're welcome.